space is really big. As Douglas Adams pointed out, space is the biggest thing you can imagine. So, if you're going to produce a science fiction television series set in space, you will need a spacecraft capable of bridging this great star-filled abyss. And in the mid-1960s, the De Silu Studios series Star Trek did just that. The answer to the interstellar challenge was the Enterprise, and in this video we will take a closer look at it. It was Walter M. Jeffries who designed this Starship class vessel. The term Constitution class came later. Producer Gene Roddenberry had the brief. We're out in deep space, on the equivalent of a cruiser-sized spaceship. We don't know what the mode of power is, but I don't want to see any trails of fire. No streaks of smoke, no jet intakes, rocket exhaust, or anything like that. It will be like a deep space exploration vehicle, operating throughout our galaxy. His ship would not be designed to land on planets, but would beam personnel down to various alien worlds. It would be the USS Yorktown, and it would use its space warp drive to travel across the stars. It would be home to 150 to 200 people. It would be fast, and it would be the primary setting for the series. Happily for international viewers, the name Yorktown was eventually replaced with Enterprise. After all, naming a spacecraft with an international crew the Yorktown would have been like naming it the Trafalgar. Great if you're British, but the French and the Spanish amongst the crew would probably not have been so happy. The 1781 battle fought at Yorktown saw the defeat of the British under Cornwallis by a Franco-American force under Washington and Lafayette, and was a pivotal moment during the American War of Independence. Commemorating a battle fought between nations that, by the 23rd century, are meant to be friends, would have somewhat undermined the message. And that would have been true even if it was named after a real ship called the USS Yorktown, as the ship itself would have been named for the battle. Perhaps the producers realised this, or perhaps not, but the name was changed. The name Enterprise was neutral and aspirational, and it was just the thing for a Starship-class vessel exploring outer space. There is the question of the prefix USS, which in the series stands for United Spaceship or United Starship, but in the real world indicates a commission ship of the US Navy. As Star Trek was made for an American audience, this would not have struck its producers as strange. Most international viewers let it slide. Jeffries, who was known by his middle name Matt, took a practical view of what his spaceship would look like. Its hull would be smooth, as everything would be inside and therefore easily accessible to the ship's crew. He also thought that if the Enterprise was to be fast and powerful, it would have powerful engines, and powerful engines would have to be kept apart from the main hull of the ship. The concept of the flying saucer was well established by the mid-1960s, and it had appeared in the classic film Forbidden Planet and on television in the guise of the Jupiter II in Lost in Space. Jeffries was initially resistant to the saucer. For the hull, I didn't really want a saucer because of the term flying saucer, and the best pressure vessel, of course, is a ball. So I started playing with that. But the bulk got in the way, and the ball just didn't work. I flattened it out, and I guess we wound up with a saucer. What Matt Jeffries eventually had was four connected parts. A saucer attached to a cylinder by way of a slanting dorsal support or neck, and from the cylinder, long pylons running up to a pair of engines shaped like long cigars. The saucer bulged at its center, and atop the bulge was the bridge, whilst at the front end of the large cylinder there was fitted a satellite dish the navigational deflector, and at the back end were clamshell doors for the ship's hangar. 
In length, it was comparable to a large nuclear-powered American aircraft carrier, a good 288 meters, or nearly a thousand feet. A final touch was the hull registration number, NCC-1701. It reflected the license number of Matt Jeffrey's own 1935 Waco YOC aircraft, NC-17740, but modified so it could be seen more clearly by viewers. The model was built at the production model shop in Burbank, California, by Richard C. Dayton, Jr., Volmir Jensen, Mel Keyes, and Vernon Sion. It was made from vacuum-formed plastic and poplar wood, with metal tubes for the engines. It was 3.3 metres, or 11 feet, in length, 18 centimetres, or 32 inches, in height, and the saucer had a diameter of 152 centimetres, or 60 inches. Incidentally, although not immediately apparent, the initial Enterprise design seen in the first pilot episode, The Cage, was subtly different to that of the regular television series. Its bridge module was taller. There were spikes attached to the nacelles, and the trailing ends of those nacelles lacked the silver balls seen on the regular series Enterprise. The Enterprise developed into a starship with 11 decks and a crew of 400. It would be armed with phasers and photon torpedoes, as the galaxy was a dangerous place, and there are those pesky Klingons and hostile Romulans to guard against. Whilst equipped with matter transporters to beam landing parties down to alien planets, the Enterprise also had shuttlecraft, which were accommodated in its hangar. It is sometimes said that the design is not large enough to accommodate a crew of 400. However, this is not true. Here we see a modern warship, the Type 45 Daring Class Destroyer of the Royal Navy, alongside the Enterprise, and apparently flying through space. The Daring Class Destroyer is half the length of the starship, and its normal complement is some 190, but with accommodation for up to 285. The Enterprise dwarfs it, and with a diameter of 127 metres, or 417 feet, the saucer of the fictional spacecraft gives the Enterprise vastly more floor space. Not only could it accommodate 400 people, but it could probably accommodate considerably more. But there are problems with the design. The refit Enterprise of the movies is referred to as a heavy cruiser and a Federation battle cruiser in Star Trek III The Search for Spock. But its bridge is very exposed for a warship, and its neck and engine pylons are structural weak points. Although the Enterprise is meant to be a ship of exploration rather than a frontline battle. They weren't expecting to take her into combat, you know. Yet those structural weak points remain, and we can imagine too much warp speed would eventually lead to structural failure. Which brings us to another problem. The engines are too high. They are too far above the ship's centre of gravity to be effective as a means of propulsion. Nonetheless, the original Enterprise is an elegant design, and recognisable even by those who have never watched Star Trek. Matt Jeffrey's design has become iconic, and its echo has survived 60 years of science fiction, six original series films, a spin-off series, four next generation films, and three alternative Star Trek films and their spin-offs. An American space shuttle was named after the Enterprise, and so deep is the association of that particular name with space travel that two British survey ships, one the 120-ton inshore vessel Enterprise of 1959, and the other, the current, 3,700-ton Echo-class Enterprise of 2002, share a familiar nickname, the Starship. <laughs>